Okay, so we are. Yes, it is recording. So we are here on December 25th, Christmas Day, as it's called. Yay! But we are here uh, to study our Torah portion for this week, which is Shemot, or names. Um, that's uh, the first chapter in Exodus, is where we start. And, but before we get into the text, I want to say a few things about the season. And I know we've actually had a lot of discussion just uh, today before we started here, just fellowshipping. But I want to remind us, um, especially as we talk about our journeys in Torah, you know, where we started, where we came from, being conscious of some of these things. So we know that there's a lot of debates regarding the birth date of Yeshua, mm -hmm. right? Um, but ultimately, we have to remember that this date is inconsequential. It's really irrelevant. Yeshua's birth is only significant as it relates to his sacrificial death. He was born to die. Yes. Right? So now, if we understand that there's no prohibition, right? There's nothing in the scripture that says you can't celebrate his birth. Okay? And we may do that if we want to honor our Messiah. But we want to make sure if that's our conviction, if that's how we feel, if that's something we want to participate in, we want to do it in such a way that we're not mixing idolatry and paganism in an attempt to honor our Messiah. Okay? Which, that kind of creates a difficulty because I don't know how you would do some of these things without incorporating I paganism and idolatry. Mm -hmm. um, what we are called to do, scripturally, is to remember his death, to honor his death. Right. Right? That's a good place to start. So, as it relates to Christmas, the tradition of Christmas in our Western culture, um, as being Messianic believers, you know, believing in Yeshua, recognizing the um, unbiblical cultural influences that surround this holiday season, we want to walk in grace and peace and love with those around us. Right. Okay? We don't, we don't ever want to take the scripture and, you know, beat people over the heads with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've arrived at the truth and you're in error and let me correct you, this kind of mentality. Right? <clears throat> I'm trying to. <laughs> you know, a lot of us, for 40 plus years of my life, I participated in Christmas. Okay? So we all have to start somewhere. We're not going to get people to open their eyes and hearts to the truth of Scripture if we're constantly keeping them in a state of offense. Now, that doesn't mean that we compromise, that doesn't mean that we back off our standards. But we have to reach people with grace. Yeah. Because we were afforded that same grace on our journey. So something to keep in mind. Um, New Year's will be next week. And I want to say a few things about that. Now, keeping in mind that New Year's is a secular holiday. There is nothing remotely scriptural or biblical about it. Now, that doesn't mean that it's inherently evil, right? The 4th of July is a secular holiday, yet there's no prohibition to participate in that, right? No, other things like that. So, it's interesting that some churches would offer a service um, on this day that's not a biblical holiday. Yeah. Um, but this is interesting. I actually learned this, that... Um, churches that have a, a Roman influence or a background or history, if you will, they had a service and it was called the Festival of Christ's Circumcision. And I thought, I had never heard that term before. I thought that was very interesting because it falls eight days after Christmas. And what, what happens on the eighth day? The Brit Milah, yeah. the circumcision, right? Which is a nod right back to Torah. So now we have a group of 
professing believers that would say, if Yeshua is born on the 25th, right, that's his birthday, yeah. then eight days later, we're going to remember his circumcision. Okay. I thought that was pretty interesting. I had never seen that before. Um, but now, what does Torah have to say about New Year's? Because it does speak to this. So according to Torah, according to our scripture, there are actually two New Year's. And they are completely distinct from the secular New Year that we would, you know, commonly celebrate. You know, the, the, the change of the Gregorian calendar. <coughs> yeah. So the month of Nisan 1, which is Rosh Chodeshim, you can find that in Exodus 12 too, that commemorates the month that the um, Israel was redeemed and they fled from Egypt. It was in that month. It's also the same month that Yeshua was sacrificed on the cross. So that's one time we would celebrate a new year, if you will. Then we have Tishri, and that's Yom Teruah, or Rosh Hashanah. That's Exodus 23, 16. That's the head of the year, which begins the days of awe, which is a time where we examine ourselves, right? We introspectively look at ourselves. We seek to repent from anything that, you know, wherever we're missing the mark. And that climax is on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, right? Where we present ourselves to the Lord. In the days of awe, isn't it an eight-day eight day period? Um, I thought it was a ten-day period. Oh. Yes. So. The ten days. Oh, yeah. The ten days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So. <laughs> so, pretty interesting where we're at in the Gregorian calendar and traditions in our Western culture. But again, we don't want to go around condemning people. No. We maintain our faith. We maintain our standard. We can be bold, but we don't want to be offensive. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So, let's get into our Torah portion. And the scripture passage, Exodus chapter 1, we're right in the book of Exodus, and the opening line is, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came into Egypt with Jacob. Each man came with his household, and it lists all the names. Then we get it in verse 6, Joseph died as did all his brothers and all that generation. This is, gets worse than interest because we have a time gap here. We don't really know how many years, at least by this text, how many years have transpired. But we know the descendants of Israel, verse 7, were fruitful, increased abundantly, multiplied, and grew very powerful. The land became filled with them. Yay. All right? So this is interesting because... We get to this the story, and what happens? Pharaoh forgets about Joseph, Joseph's legacy, right? His reputation, all the things that he did, how God used him to save not only his people, but Egypt itself, right? And yet we have a new leader comes to power. He doesn't know, he, he either refusing to acknowledge or doesn't know, or however we want to phrase it. Yeah. He's ignorant of Joseph and his contribution to their their history. And so he ends up like, whoa, who are all these people, right? There really, there's a lot of people here and it's concerning because I don't know if they're for us or against us. What happens if they change their mind? We're not in a good position. So we need to do something about this. Now, verse 10, it's, uh, it's talking about Pharaoh, right? So Pharaoh, he says, come, let us use wisdom in dealing with them. Talking about the Israelite people. He says, otherwise, they'll continue to multiply, and in the event of war, they might ally themselves with our enemies, fight against us, and leave the land altogether. Now, this is interesting. It's like, okay, they possess a potential military threat, Right? should they decide to rise against us? Because what does the text say? That they grew very powerful. Or, the, the other concern was that they leave. 
which would suggest a reliance upon the Israelite people. Right? They're an integral part of our society, our culture, our infrastructure. Right? We don't want them to just take off. They're doing a lot of stuff, and if they take off, we're going to be in a bad position. So two problems. Now, commentary on verse 10. Let's go back there. He says, come and let us use wisdom in dealing with them. The commentary says that one of the phrases used there is with a soft mouth or with gentle speech. Okay? Now, it's interesting because the sages go on to say that Pharaoh tricked the people. He didn't just get right up there and say, okay, um, today's Tuesday and you're on my slave now. Right? <laughs> because that's going to go over really well. Especially if you're concerned that the people outnumber you, right? That they're very powerful and you don't want to have to fight against them. So you're not going to go and just be offensive right off the bat, right? He says, let's use wisdom. How can we do this? Okay? So here's what the sages say. That Pharaoh made patriotic speeches, seeking volunteers to build new cities for the glory of Egypt. He even went and started making bricks with his own hands, right? Like, we need volunteers, we need to build great cities for Egypt, right? All this stuff. And he starts making bricks. You can imagine how, um, you know, if you're a patriotic person, how this is very inspiring. Look at our leader. Look what he's doing. Let's, let's get behind this vision. Bring makers are heroes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and so the Israelites, they buy into this. They start working hard to demonstrate their patriotism to their host nation. Now remember, what was the relationship in Egypt, right? They come to Egypt, they're given the land of Goshen, they're unmolested, they're protected, they're provided for. Pharaoh is an ally up to this point. You know, everything that Joseph's doing, they're multiplying their generations, they're doing well in the land of Egypt, in this land. So this host nation, you would imagine that they had positive feelings for this host nation, okay? And then the leader comes and he starts making patriotic speeches. Yeah, I like it here. I like living here. It's been good to me. Yeah, let's. I can get behind that vision. Yeah, let's make this place even better. Awesome. Then, some time goes by, we don't know how long. Pharaoh issues a decree requiring the Israelites to perform the work that they had so eagerly provided. So now... I don't get to, I have to. And that's the switch. Because now, maybe, I get behind this vision, I'm making bricks, I'm probably getting paid, or I'm deriving some sort of livelihood through the whole process of city building, right? Maybe I provide the straw, maybe I have um, the oxen and I'm transporting, however it looks, right? I could be um, financially invested in this process. <coughs> Or maybe a better way to say somewhat reliant on this. Okay, I mean either way, I'm invested. And then all of a sudden the decree comes out. Well, you have to do this. Well, shoot, I'm in it now. I can't just leave, right? I might be walking away from my livelihood. Mm -hmm. So let me just do whatever the decree says, because I don't want to lose my job over it, which has a familiar tone for us today. Yeah. So, time goes by. Israel soon found herself seduced into slavery. Remember, Pharaoh's concern was that this was a powerful people. So I can't just offend them right off the bat. They might take me out. I have to seduce them. Get them to a place of reliance. Get them to a place where they're entrenched in the system, if you will. Then I can flip the switch. And I'll get compliance. So Israel transitioned from a free and sovereign nation into slaves of a pagan ruler by becoming entrenched with the surrounding culture. Now that's my commentary, that's my viewpoint. You may feel free to disagree. But it was possible that with the progressive loss of freedoms, and again, my proposal is that this did not happen overnight. Right. Pharaoh didn't get up on Tuesday, 
you're all my slaves and that's it. And this is your taskmaster, taskmaster Bob, and he'll direct you on what you have to do here, here, you know, henceforth. It didn't work that way. It had to be progressive, right? The, the, we have the analogy of the frog in the pot. Yeah. You put the frog in, you put him in boiling water, he jumps out. But if you slowly raise the temperature, he'll stay in there until he dies. Yeah, this is nice. It's like hot tub. Yeah. So it was possible that it was a progressive loss of freedoms and an embracing of varying controls. Oh, well, you know, he just mandated that I got to... I'm making bricks anyway. So, you know, it's really important to the building of the city. So, I, I you know, I can, I can understand why this is mandated now. It's like the war effort, right? <laughs> I can get behind that. Serving my country. So oh, I, I understand he had to take some of my livestock. It's for the good of the country, right? Mm -hmm. well, I know he needs he needs us all to work extra hours this week. So, but it's all for it's all for the glory of Egypt. So we can do that. Progressive loss of freedoms, embracing of varying controls that lead to bondage. You wake up one day and you realize, wait a minute, I did not sign up for this. Now I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. Sounds like what they're trying to do with COVID. Get it does. Shot for the for the elderly, get your shot for the whatever. Yeah, yeah. Progressive loss of freedoms and control. Mm -hmm. So, what was the response? Well, we have this beautiful example going down to verse fifteen. Okay. Well, actually, let me. Um, yeah. It says moreover, the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, and it gives their uh, two Hebrew midwives specifically. And gives her names. And this is interesting. We have this beautiful example of civil disobedience. Okay? Mm -hmm. They refuse to obey Pharaoh's decree to slaughter the infant children. Right? And so Pharaoh says, look, if it's a boy, kill him. If it's a girl, let her live. And what does it say about the Hebrew midwives? Verse 17. They were God-fearing women, so they didn't do as the king of Egypt ordered. <laughs> If there's ever an example of unrighteous rules and decrees coming down to God's people and the proper response, civil disobedience. They didn't start riots. They didn't start all kinds of stuff. They just said, we fear God. We'll comply with the laws of the land until the laws of the land cross right. our scriptural, biblical faith mandates. Right. right? <clears throat> this is counter to God's work. I'm not doing that. That's the line in the sand. Yeah, we're going to do that. So, now, why is this important? Other than their, their example, we actually have, for this Torah portion, we have uh, a few examples of how the nation of Israel was saved by the Hebrew women. Mm -hmm. Right? We always think, we think of Joseph, Moses, right? Uh, Joshua. Isaiah, Yeshua, right? All the patriarchs, all the men who came and did something great for the nation. And we often miss how Hebrew women, how the women actually saved the nation. Okay? So they did this on two fronts. So the midwives, they refused to kill the next generation, right? If you want to get rid of a people, just don't let them have kids. 30, 40 years, they're going to be gone. Easy. Okay? They refused. They saved the nation in that regard. Now, there's um, the sages give us some more information, and they talk about during this time of enslavement where things were bad, that the men actually withdrew from their wives. Um, and it's a, a colorful way of saying that they wouldn't they wouldn't have marital relations with them. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is the men said, look, we don't want to start having kids. So they can just be born into captivity, right? We don't want to birth more slaves for Pharaoh. So we're just we're not gonna we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna have kids. Well, it was the Hebrew wives that pressed their husbands. They kept like, no, we're not, that's that's not an appropriate response, right? Why? We have a command in Genesis 1:28. Be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. yeah. That command was not conditional. It wasn't, well, if things are good 
and things are going well for you, then be fruitful more. But if things are bad, you know, you can hold back. No. It says you're in the land, be fruitful and multiply. So do it. That's a command. Right. And the wives are like telling their husbands, you're not pulling this stunt, right? You're not <laughs> depriving us of children because of your fears, because of the things that we're experiencing on a national level, mm -hmm. you know? And so they end up multiplying more. What happens? That the more Pharaoh oppresses, the more population grows, mm -hmm. okay? The more they get blessed. And so that was another account of how the Hebrew women actually saved the nation. And we'll, we'll have another example. So now we come to Moses, right? He is the hero and the focal point of our Torah portion, right? As we jump into Exodus, we start to hear about Moses. Now, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So the man from the family of Levi took a woman, also descended from Levi as his wife, when she conceived and had a son, upon seeing what a fine child he was, she hid him for three months. When she could no longer hide him, she took a basket, coated it with clay and tar, put the child in and placed it among the reeds on the riverbank. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen. Now again, another Hebrew wife saving her child, okay? Now, what do we know from our vantage point? We know Moses was the instrument by which God used to redeem the nation. Right. So again, we could say that his mother was another Hebrew woman that was saving the nation, okay? It's kind of a theme. So it says, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river while her maids were in attendance. Walking, uh, walked along the riverside, spotting the basket among the reeds. She sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and looked inside. And there in front of her was a crying baby boy. Moved with pity, she said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. At this point, his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like me to go and find you one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter answered, yes, go. So the girl went and called the baby's own mother. Pharaoh's daughter took her, take this child away, nurse it for me, and I will pay you for doing it. So the woman took the child and nursed it. Then when the child had grown some, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she began to raise him as her son. She called him Moshe, or Moses, which means to pull out or to save, because I pulled him out of the water. Now this is interesting. God orchestrates this whole thing. Baby Moses is saved. Mom still gets to raise him. And then before he gets handed off to Pharaoh's daughter. All right. So I like this, you know, Moses, which means to draw or to save. A lot of times we don't hear about that other meaning to save. But this comes into play a little bit later. But here... You know, she recognized him as one of the Hebrews' children, right? This must be one of the Hebrews' children, okay? But what happens when she claims him as her son, she gives him a name. Now here, Moses is identified. He's labeled by Egypt, okay? From this point on, he's a son of Egypt. He belongs to that culture, right? She raises him as a son. He goes to the best schools. He gets all the training, all the trappings, everything that a person of royalty in that culture would receive, right? He becomes a product of that culture. Hmm. Even though he has a different background, that's irrelevant. He's part of that culture. Hmm. So now, as we move on in the story, Scripture alludes that he knew of his lineage, okay? Yep, my destiny, my, my descendancy was from Hebrew parents. All right? Um, chapter 2, verse 11. Um, what does it say here? It says, one day when Moses was a grown man, he went out to visit his kinsmen. So he recognized the people that were in bondage. These are my people. Even though he's been a son of Egypt, and by a large degree still is. 
Now, we get some more information if we depart from our text and look at some other books. And this is the book of Jasher, and this was something that was completely new to me. I did not know this uh, prior to studying for, for this Torah portion. So we hear about Moses tries, he, he kills the Egyptian, right? He tries to break up the fight with his brother, uh, between two of his kinsmen, and they're like, are you going to do me like you did that Egyptian? He's like, oh man, I'm found out, i got to get out of here, <laughs> right? And then the next time we see him, he's in Midian. There's a gap there. Hmm. He didn't go right from Egypt to Midian, according to the book of Joshua. No, you got. There was a, a really significant gap. So, sages suggest that Moses was approximately 18 years of age when he left Egypt. Okay? Oh, it was there. Oh. Yeah. Now, the book of Joshua says that at age 27, hmm. Moses became ruler in the land of Cush and dwelled there until he was age 66. And that's when we hear of him again? That's when we hear him. Okay. So he's 66 years old when he comes to Midian, according mm -hmm. to the book of Jasher. Now there's 13 verses. Let me kind of hop and skip through here. Um, it says, And Moses, the son of Amram, was still king in the land of Cush in those days, and he prospered in his kingdom. And he conducted the government of the children of Cush in justice, in righteousness, and integrity. And all the land, um, and all the children of Cush loved Moses all the days that he reigned over them, and all the inhabitants of the land of Cush were greatly afraid of him. And in the fortieth year of the reign of Moses over Cush, so he's there for a while. He's in leadership, right? He's ruling and reigning in the land of Cush. Well, it comes about that this queen, um, Adonai, she says, look, this dude that you guys are submitting under, he's not of our people. Why are you doing this? This and that. And so she kind of, there's this, this coup, if you will. And go down to verse 6. It says, now therefore here, children of Cush, let this man no more reign over you, as he is not of our flesh. Um, she presents her son, like, let, let's let him rule so on and so forth. And then verse 8, all the people and nobles of the children of Cush heard the words which Adonai the queen had spoken in their ears, and all the people were preparing until the evening. In the morning they rose up early, made her son king, and all the children of Cush were afraid to stretch forth their hand against Moses. And so they, they're basically, they're like, okay, this other guy's going to be king. Uh, Moses, we're not going to fight against you because you know, you've know been good to us, all these other things. And so Moses just ends up leaving, right? Um, verse 11 says, But the children of Cush gave many presents to Moses and sent him from them with great honor. So Moses went forth from the land of Cush and went home and ceased to reign over Cush. And Moses was 66 years old when he went out of the land of Cush. So... This is interesting, because now, you can imagine all of Moses' training in Egypt, all the skills, everything that he obtained in that culture, he was able to use to rule and reign in Cush. Right? He still hasn't, he's still not God's man, okay? He's, he's just doing his thing, and he comes to Midian. I think this is interesting because this is approximately a 40 year period. And when Moses comes to Midian, we like to think of him as almost embracing his Hebraic roots, right? That's kind of the picture we're presented with. Like, I come to terms with everything and now I'm, now I'm in Midian and I'm just waiting on God's, you know, an encounter with God. But it took Moses 40 years to unlearn the ways of Egypt. And this goes back to the issue of having grace with others, right? How long does it, did it take us to unlearn some things when we came to the truth, mm -hmm. right? For Moses, it was 40 years. And that was just from Egypt to Midian. He still had a long way to go mm -hmm. uh, before he 
he was ready for, for his calling. Now, where were we at? Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now Moses was tending the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Now I want to spend a little time here and talk about his father-in-law. And this goes back to where is Moses, you know, his trans transitory process from being a son of Egypt into being the man called of God, right? So Moses' father-in-law was priest of Midian. Well, what do we know about Midian? We know it's predominantly a pagan culture. It's full of idolatrous worship and a whole lot of other stuff going on, right? <clears throat> now, Numbers 25, uh, 20, chapter 25, verses 6, 6 through 9, and Numbers 31, 16. We get this glimpse, and we haven't talked about this yet, um, unless you look at the last time we, we came on this sort of portion. But Balak's counsel to Balak was to, I can't curse Israel, right? I, I tried, you paid me to curse them, and I just keep blessing them. So look, if you want to defeat Israel, this is what you do. You get the daughters of Midian to seduce the men, right? <coughs> they'll form these relationships, and then they'll start worshiping these pagan gods. That may work. That, yeah, it's a good plan, right? Yeah. So that's, how we, that's where we see Midian again. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a couple of different views about Moses' father-in-law. Either he was a pagan priest, right? It's a high probability that he was yeah. serving other gods and that he was a priest of one of these other, other religions. Or he was a standout and he was a priest of the one true God. Right? Two, two views. So now the text gives us two different names for his father-in-law. And that's if we examine the names, we'll get a glimpse here. So view number one that he, he was a priest of Midian, that he was serving yod heh the one true God, right? Mm -hmm. He was God's priest. Well, Jethro, that's one of the names given to him, means his excellence. Now, this is interesting because if you look at when they, when they put this out there, it's his is lowercase, right? So it's just could be anybody's excellence. So it's more of a title. So that's pretty neutral. But then another name is Reuel, R-E-U-L, which means friend of God, capital G. And the only time we see a capital G in a lot of our texts and translations when it's direct reference to the Father. Okay? The same thing is said about Moses, that he was a friend of God. So this is interesting. Now, we come later, after the Exodus, um, in Exodus 18, where we see that Moses tells them all the things that God did to bring the people out of Egypt, and he's like, oh, this is great. Let's sacrifice. Let's sacrifice to God. Well, wait a minute. We could make the argument that either the pagan gods that he was supposedly priests over had similar sacrificial practices, or there was an Abrahamic influence, and he knew how to properly make a sacrifice, make an offering to the one true God. Now, if we look in your handout, you'll see the genealogy of Abraham. And so Abraham, remember, he, he married Keturah and Hagar and then Sarah, right? Now, Keturah, he had what? One, two, three, six offspring. He had Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, and then Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. So Midian is part of the Abrahamic line. Mm -hmm. This is where it gets interesting. This is where we say maybe he was a priest of the one true God, and he was a standout in his culture. Because it seems that he's, we could say that it seems like he almost knows how to make a proper sacrifice. How would he know that? 
unless that was passed down. Mm -hmm. Right? That's cool, yeah. Because it's known as the land of Midian. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously homeboy son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Son. So there's a this Abrahamic influence, which is it makes things interesting. Now let's look at our other view. Let's say he was a pagan, a pagan priest. So Exodus 18, the same passage that we would suggest is Abrahamic influence. The other view says no. This is actually his response to Moses' testimony that his declaration is seen as a type of conversion. And then he moves to acceptance of the one true God, yod heh vav -Heh. Let's look at that Exodus 18, because I want to read that, verse 10 and 11. And verse 10. He says, Yithro, or Jethro, said, Blessed be Adonai, who has rescued you from the Egyptians, and from Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from the harsh hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Adonai is greater than all other gods, because he rescued those who were treated so arrogantly. Mm -hmm. And then verse 12, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. So this is interesting because we'll look at verse 12 and we'll say, oh, he knows how to bring burnt offerings. Mm -hmm. He must have known something of the one true God. And then verse 10 and 11, we'll say, no, he was a pagan priest because now his statement that he, that Adonai is greater than all the other gods, which I happen to be a priest over, right? Yeah. Don't know. Two views. So it would suggest that there was a prior paganism, or at best, a form of syncretism, right? Maybe who's familiar with the one true God and those, those worship practices, but yet he was also equally familiar with the pagan practices of the land. Maybe he was doing both, right? Interesting. We see this, we see this other picture with Balaam, right? Balaam was known as, as being able to curse someone. That was his like spiritual gifting, his power, is he could look at something and curse it and it would come to pass. But yet, what does the scripture tell us about him? That he hears from God. So it's this interesting dichotomy. Yeah, that's crazy. So maybe, maybe we have a similar thing going on with Jethro. But now, what is this, why is this relevant? Given the two views, whether he's a servant of the Most High God or he's a pagan priest, it would be very possible that Jethro would have been able to familiarize Moses with some Hebraic understanding. He could have communicated the laws and the mitzvot that he learned from the lineage of Abraham, and he could communicate that to Moses. Right? Because keep in mind, Moses is the son of of Egypt, right? right? His, the, the scripture tells us that after three months, he was sent. Now, how long was he nursed? I don't know. But you can imagine that's whether it was one year, two years, three years, whatever it was, it was going to be a much shorter time than when he was an adult. Mm -hmm. That time period from after he was being nursed to adulthood it's probably many more years that he steeped in Egyptian culture, right. mindset, and thinking. Yeah. So he's got a lot to learn. Now he's ruling and reigning in Cush. Then he comes to Midian. So where is he getting his information from? It's quite possible, and this is my proposal, that his father-in-law was actually educating him in some of these things. Was it complete? If he's a pagan priest, probably not. If he was a servant of the Most High God, maybe. Either way, he's getting some information. And this goes back to where are we at on our journey compared to others? Others are just hearing little bits and little pieces, right? They're not getting a complete picture, maybe because they're, they're not completely in it, right? They're... They're going traditionally one way, and then they're getting some new information, and they're having to process this stuff, and that takes time. It took Moses over 40 years. 
hopefully it won't take everybody else that long. <laughs> so, because we don't we don't have the longevity that a lot of the uh, Bible patriarchs did. So, okay. Now, so Moses doing his thing. Da, da, da. He has the the thing with the burning bush. We'll come back to that a little bit. Um, he has this great encounter with God, right? And that changes everything. Okay, God has called me, right? I had this experience at the burning bush. God has called me. I've got a mission. I've got a mandate. Now I've got to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay? So let's jump to Exodus chapter 4. And here we have this really weird passage that... To be honest, I, I probably just glossed over it as many times as I've read this. I, I never really picked up on it. Chapter 4, verse 24. So Moses is leaving. He's leaving Midian. He's, he's got his family with him, and he's, I'm God's man, and I'm going about God's mission. Right? I'm on my way. So keep going back to Egypt. Now verse 24 says, At a lodging place on the way, Adonai, so God himself, he just had an encounter with God at the burning bush. Right. So, okay, we're, we're, on, we're on, our, on our way back, and uh, we're staying at the Holiday Inn, and we get a knock on the door, yeah. and look, it's God himself. <laughs> All right. Adonai meets Moses and would have killed him. Wait a minute. You just told me we're at the burning bush. I had an encounter with God. You told me I have a mission and a mandate. And I'm on my way to perform this work, right? And you're going to meet me and be like, I'm going to have to take you out. Like, what, what, what happened? Yeah, what just happened? What, like, did I do something? What's going on here? Okay, why did God stay his hand? Verse 25. Had not Zephorah, his wife, taken a flint stone and cut up the foreskin of her son? She threw it at his feet, saying, What a bloody bridegroom you are for me. But then God, but then God let Moses be. Okay, what just happened here? God's like, I'm killing you. You're done. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm confused. Okay. So Moses was spared by the actions of his wife, who was a Hebrew wife now, right? Again, Israel was saved by the actions of a Hebrew wife. For the instrument of God's redemption, Moses, was again saved, which his name literally means to save. His mother saved him, and now his wife saved him, and hence the nation. But why was, what's, I mean, what was his violation here? Right? Well, the Abrahamic covenant of circumcision. That's instituted in Genesis 17.10, right? This is a sign of the covenant that I will have between me and you, that you will be circumcised in all your males. On the eighth day, they'll be circumcised. So, this is interesting because Moses neglects this. We don't know what son this is. Because we know Gershom, who was born, he was much older. So, the idea is that if it was him, he waited a long time before he was circumcised. Right. Or this is another son that that's a little fuzzy. We don't get a lot of clarity from, from the text. But here's the thing. Zephora understood the requirement of circumcision. Now she was a Midianite woman. She marries a Hebrew, hence becoming a Hebrew wife. Right? She understood the requirement of, of circumcision, actually rebuking her husband for the neglect of God's command. Had she not stepped in, God was like, I'm taking you out. Because you've already neglected one of my commands. Yeah. Right? I sent you on a mission. Did you, you, you forget? We didn't even have the whole Mosaic Law at this point mm. given by God. <clears throat> like, we're just getting started. Which I think underscores the seriousness of circumcision. That's probably a conversation for another time. But now, let me give you my, this is my, my thoughts. Uh, receive a more rejected. 
If Zephora, his wife, learned from Moses, where did he learn it from? Possibly his father-in-law. Because we know that this wasn't a, an Egyptian custom. Maybe one of the ways that Pharaoh's daughter knew that Moses, the infant, was one of the Hebrews' children because he was already circumcised. She looks, changes his diaper or whatever. Oh, that's one of the Hebrew babies. Right? Because we don't do that to our kids. Yeah. Or maybe Zephora learned from her father Jethro due to the Abrahamic influence. And she's like, look, you neglected this. God himself was going to take you out over it. I stepped in and got this done. Because the women don't normally do that. So it's pretty interesting. We wonder, where, does, where is Moses getting this information? But either way, whether it was from some form of syncretism or from somebody stand out in the culture, God was transferring him. He was bringing him along on the path. Now, going back to the burning bush. Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And it says, The angel of Adonai appeared to him in a fire blazing from the middle of a bush. He looked and saw that although the bush was flaming with fire, yet the bush was not being burned up. So he has this paradox, right? Man, this is an amazing sight, he says. This bush is on fire and it's not burning up. I'm going to go check it out. has this great encounter with God. Okay? Then Exodus 3.14 Actually, let's go to 13. It says, Moses says to God, Look, when I appear before the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What am I to tell them? God says to Moses, Eye, Asher, Eye, I am or will be what I am or will be. Or I am that I am, or I will be what I will be. And so this is interesting because we get this insight into God's name, and not just his name, his character. And I think this is what was partially uh, trying, he was trying to reveal in this natural phenomenon of this burning bush that wasn't consumed. It's a paradox. So God's statement reveals that he is the one who is and is to come. We see that in Revelation 1.8. And God is essentially unrepresentable. And when we get into the commands, right, don't have, don't make any idols, don't make any likeness, don't make any carved image of me, right? Because you can't. We can try, but I'm, I exist outside of time and eternity and physical space, right? There's nothing you can use in these finite spheres to represent me. It's not possible. So don't try, please. Yeah. It's a commandment. <laughs> so the mystery of God and his name is a paradox. He is transcendent, right? Beyond space and time, yet imminent, right? Existing within human history, right? We have this rich history in the scriptures of God interacting with his people in time and space and in physical ways. But yet he exists outside of all these things. And that's where we come to this thing with the burning bush, right? If you set a bush on fire, it has to be consumed. That's the physical nature of things, mm -hmm. right? But yet Moses sees the bush, it's on fire, it's not burning. I'm going to look at this amazing sight because this does not happen. This is not normal. Something else is going on. So that paradox, the burning bush, is God revealing the mystery of his nature. Right? I am who I am and I will be what I will be. You might not understand that. I know what I'm talking about. Right? 
Our responsibility is not to understand the mystery of his name, but to respond like Moses. What does Moses say? He says, Hineni, or here I am, which has the connotation, I am willing to do whatever you wish before you even ask. Here I am. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready. I'm present. Let me see if I can find that passage. Um, it was verse... That's the proper response to the word Shema. Yes. Yep. Yeah, you're exactly right. Just, here I am. Uh, mm -hmm. Chapter 3, verse 4. When Adam and I saw that he had gone over to see, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. He answered, here I am. Translate the Hebrews in eight. I'm willing to do whatever you wish. Right? <laughs> so... Even though, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, it's like we get to the circumcision. It's like I'm gonna do whatever you want me to do, and then all of a sudden, God's like, I'm gonna have to take you out, man. You're messing up already. We're not even started yet. It's interesting. So I did make a typo um, in the Brit Hadashah. It's I put Acts 17. It's Acts 7, verse 17. So you can make that correction in your notes. Circumcise that out of there. So yeah, circumcise that out of there. So, so it's Acts, Acts 7. chapter 7, verse 17. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I like to review, you know, and I'm going over, I'm like, okay, Acts 17, I'm like, this passage has nothing to do with what we're talking I'm like, I don't think that's right. And I'm looking, I'm like, oh, yeah, I put a 1 in there. All right, Acts 17, or Acts 7, see, I'm doing it already. Let's look at verse 25, because basically chapter 7 is a recounting of everything that happens up to this point, right? We're, we're talking about, um, you know, how Joseph brings the people to Egypt, how they have favor, and then all of a sudden everything switches. And then we, we take a look at Moses. Okay? Now, Acts 7, verse 25. It says, he supposed his brothers, speaking of Moses, would understand that God was using him to rescue them, but they didn't understand. Right? What happens when he tries to stop the fight between the, his two kinsmen? Who made you ruler over us? Who made you our Lord? Well, actually... <laughs> but, you know... Um, and then verse 35... It says, this Moses, whom they rejected, who made you a ruler and judge, is the very one whom God sent as both ruler and ransomer by means of the angel that appeared to him in the thorn bush. Right? So actually, God made me your ruler and redeemer. They didn't recognize that. Now, this is interesting because it dovetails right on the, on the end of Joseph's story, right? Where Joseph being the disguised Egyptian. Okay? He's ruling and reigning in a pagan culture, in a pagan land. He looks like a pagan ruler. And yet his brothers are before him, and he reveals himself to them. Look, it's me, Joseph. Okay? Moses appears as an Egyptian. Remember, he's a son of Egypt. He has to go through this long process to become God's servant. But he appears as an Egyptian until he is revealed as God's Redeemer. Now, Yeshua, if we consider the context of the Jewish population of our day, right? We, and this is a broad categorization, but Jews generally disregard Yeshua as the Messiah, right? Right. Now, to them, Yeshua appears as an Egyptian. He's part of a pagan culture, right? We've turned him into this Western construct where we present him as being lawless, being, you know, not following Torah, as actually doing away with Torah, right? You mean like the American church? Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's predominantly how Yeshua is presented in a lot of contexts. So he's rejected by his people when? Until he returns as king. Because right? he's coming back to right. rule and to reign. And then every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Right. 
So how Yeshua is presented, he's presented as the disguised Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And so as we live out our faith, one of the things we have the privilege of doing is saying, no, this is your brother Joseph. Mm -hmm. This is Moses. He's a redeemer. Right. This is Yeshua. Okay? We can present him in his proper context. No, he doesn't, he's not doing away with Torah. He's filling the commands up with meaning. Yeah. He's expanding our understanding of these things. Right? He's bringing a foundation and a faith to them. He's bringing them to life. We get to, we get to present that to others. That's our joy and our privilege in the generation that we're in. Until the day where he comes, returning his king. So, It took Moses years to come to the point of his life where he was able to turn from the influence of pagan culture, to unlearn the traditions and mindsets of a foreign people, and embrace the ways of the one true God. God's hand was on him from birth, during his sojourning, and into his calling as the Lord's instrument of redemption. There was a process for Moses to go through, and he was transformed into the man he was destined to be. And this is key for us. We are all undergoing a process of transformation. Mm -hmm. There are times where, for some, they, they get exposed to the truth and, oh, that's it, I'm in. And there's other times, I don't know if I can believe that. I don't know if I can receive that. Because that's counter to everything that I've learned up to this point in my life. Mm -hmm. So now I have to wrestle with these things. But as I learn, as I'm continually exposed, then the Holy Spirit comes and does a work in my life, and I can be transformed into the person that God wants. And when I reach these points, God can use me. Now he can give me a calling, right? Because there's some trust there. There's a response. Moses had to respond to the burning bush. He could have been like, that bush is on fire and it's not being burnt up. That's weird. I'm out. <laughs> right? Yeah. He could have gone the other way. I don't know. That's bizarre looking. I'm not having anything to do with that. And, <laughs> yeah. and how often do we get those responses when we try to share Torah, when we try to share a Hebraic perspective to other, um, to our, our, our Christian brethren? They say, that's weird. That's that Jewish stuff. Um, I'm not doing anything with that. I'm out. Moses had to respond. He's like, I don't know what that is. I'm going to check it out. And then God calls him. Moses. Moses. He's calling to him. He says, hey, here I am. I'm ready. I'm ready to hear what you have to say. Then God can give him a calling. Give him a mission. A mandate. Mm -hmm. This is what I want you to do for me. So we're all on that journey. We all have to decide, am I going to respond to God? Right. What is the burning bush moment in my life? And am I going to run away? Or am I going to come closer in response? Nobody can decide that for us. We have to decide that for ourselves. So, just some few highlights from the Torah portion. Um, I did not get to Isaiah at all. I will let you read that um, on your own. And, uh, but hopefully you found it, found it enjoyable and got something out of it.